I invite you to take your Bibles in hand and turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 to 38. I'll invite Donna to come forward to read this morning's passage. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out the rebels from among you, and those who will transgress against me. And I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Thank you, Donna, for reading God's word for us this morning. Let's go to God in prayer again and invite him to speak to us this morning. Lord God, again, we come before you now to study your word together as we continue to look at the things that are and the things that are to come. And all these things that point us remind us that you are coming soon to take us home to heaven. Lord God, thank you for these words and and what you're about to say to us this morning, too. We ask the Lord God to open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning we resume our series on the escape plan. And I know it's been a little while because part of it is because of myself having been sick. And then last Sunday... Well, we had a little bit different worship experience because of not having a sermon because of one church outreach last Sunday. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, like I said, I'm still getting over this cough still. <laughs> um, but it's good to get back to look at this series on what things are going to take place in the future and what things are as well. This morning, we're actually going to be doing two parts this morning. One part of on the birth pangs that we see in Scripture, and next Sunday we'll look at the next four as well. So we're going to look at three this morning and four of them next Sunday. So let's kind of show you where we're at in our series here now. Um, we're now in this pre-tribulation period here. Like I, we talked about before, a number of the sermons before, these are all things that we don't know when they're going to take place, so we can't plot them where in the time frame of when Christ returns to take this church home to heaven and the tribulation, and after the tribulation. So these are all things, again, we don't know when they're going to happen for sure. We know the rapture, based on God's word, is going to happen before the tribulation. But we don't know when, when yet. So that's why we didn't plot that as to where in the sequence of events and timeline of what's going to take place. Um, but, again, we know it's going to happen sometime, just don't know when. Because uh, God, Jesus told us that uh, his second coming, we don't know when he'll return. And that has more to do with his second coming. We fully will come and bring judgment. But we still don't know when the rapture of the church will happen. And uh, for those who don't know what the rapture of the church is, it's when God will come down, and not come set foot on earth yet, but will come and will call his church in the clouds to take us home to heaven. And uh, if there's more to say on that, 
and so I invite you to go to our YouTube channel because I preached on that a while ago on the rapture. Now I recognize that for some of us here, there may be some differing opinions about end times theology from this point forward and even some of the things we talked about already and that's okay uh, as long as we're trying to get towards where God wants us to be on the same page about his word um, because God's word only meant what God meant it to mean. Um, sometimes people say that, well, there's so many different interpretations of God's word. Well, that's not really true. Uh, some people think they have other interpretations of God's word, but God's word only means what God intended it to mean. Now it's up to us to listen to the Holy Spirit as he guides us and study his word to know for sure what God's word says, what it means, and how to apply it to our lives. So again, with God's word, it only means what God meant it to mean. There may be different applications of that, but for the most part, uh, there's always just one meaning of what God intended. That's true, too, of what we're looking at today. <coughs> Excuse me. Today we're looking at the birth pangs, and there's one verse specifically that mentions birth pangs. So what are they? Again, these are things that are starting to happen here in pre-tribulation time. So any of these, some of these things have happened and some of these things have not happened yet. But these are all signs that Jesus is coming soon. And today, based on what I understand of God's word and understand of events that have taken place, uh, I believe for the most part, these three things we're looking at today are things that have taken place already. And uh, I get some of this understanding from uh, another author by the name of Arnold Frutenbaum. Uh, he wrote uh, quite, a, quite an extensive book called uh, In the Footsteps of the Masta Messiah. And I'll be quoting him a little bit this morning as well. Um, he takes it, he is Jewish and takes eschatology from a Jewish perspective. And as I started reading his book and reading scripture and studying God's word, it's like, it makes sense that there's a lot in eschatology that fits with the nation of Israel. And so today we're actually going to see some of that today, of how some of this fits together. We need to understand and be aware of the signs that the day of Jesus is coming, uh, calling us home to heaven, and the tribulation is coming. And it may be sooner than we think. Uh, I've, I know I've said this before already. I don't know when Christ will return to take us home to heaven. It may happen in my lifetime, it may not. But the signs certainly need to be sh showing that the time is drawn even clearer and nearer to when Christ will return to take us home to heaven. So this morning, as I mentioned, we're going to look at three of these seven birth pangs. Scripture doesn't necessarily say what all the birth pangs are, but give us a good idea as to what these birth pangs are. The first is this. Nation will be against nation. Turn with me your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. We're actually going to flip around quite a bit this morning. Uh, the passage that Donna read for us, we'll be going to that in just a moment. But the first one again is Matthew 24 verse 7. I'll actually read verse 8 as well too because this is the verse that we actually get to the idea of birth pangs. Matthew 24 verse 7 and 8. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes, all various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Well, it's interesting here because here it says in verse 8, these are the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus is telling his disciples and others who are around him at this point that here's some signs to look for because some of these signs are going to be the beginning of the birth pangs, which are going to lead to the other birth pangs as we get cl closer to Christ's second coming. And again in verse 7 here it says that the, for nation will rise against nation. This is the beginning of birth pangs that we are to take notice of. So nation will rise against nation. You might wonder and think that, well, what's the big deal about that? As long as there's been mankind, there's been wars. Well, almost as long as there's been mankind, there's been wars. But it seems like wars seem to be increasing more and more. We know we're dealing with a war right now between Russia and Ukraine. And there's some significance to that. We don't know exactly what God's plan is in that, 
But I know every time that Russia goes to war, especially these days, I take more notice as to, hmm, what's about to take place? And we'll talk about that in a future sermon a little bit further yet still too. But it's interesting because God's Word talks about Gog and Magog. And that place is actually Russia. So now, Russia against the Ukraine is not the Gog-Magog war. I want to make that clear. That, that is not the Gog-Magog war because it has to do with Israel instead. But nation will rise against nation. And Arnold Fruitenbaum talks a little bit more about that. And he believes that has more to do with Israel because of something that's important that takes place for Israel. Arnold Fruitenbaum says, and I agree with him, that it seems like this birth pang of war of nation against nation has to do with Israel and specifically World War I and World War II. In fact, some people say that, well, World War II was really actually just a continuation of World War I, even though there was a period of, of, of rest and peace between those two. But it's significant because after World War II, something important and significant that we'll talk about in a moment happens. So nation rises against nation. As we remember World War I and II, that was a pretty significant war, weren't, weren't they? Thankfully, the Allies won those wars. Because uh, otherwise, this world would look a lot different today, wouldn't it? Uh, we wouldn't have some of the freedoms that we have today. The freedoms we need to celebrate and be thankful and practice that God has given us in our nation of Canada. So this nation rising against nation, I think, has to do with World War I and II. Because what it establishes with Israel in the future, or not, not in the future now, but in the past. But also this verse says too, it mentions about there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Famines is a significant thing too, because often with wars, famines have come along with it, haven't they? Now, there's some parts of the world after World War I and II were having famines. Less food in some areas of the world. We even see that today where a lot of supply lines are being affected too. Have you gone to the grocery store in the last couple of months? You might notice that there's some products that are not restocked because they couldn't get in the stock because supply lines have been, has been disrupted. And even some places, farming has been an issue for some places with crops too. Although I've heard that in our area this year, that there's some bumper crops. And so thankfully the Lord has blessed this area to f- supply and food needs in, in our country. The famines are, are significant too. I remember several years ago, I think it was in junior high at the time, uh, I remember Ethiopia was going through a really bad drought and it caused great famine in the land, didn't it? And we look through scripture too, it talks about different famines that have happened in the past. But God's Word is telling us that this is going to increase too, especially as wars increase, where there's more wars and rumors of wars. Pretty significant. Look at this day and age too. We didn't hear about a lot of the wars that happened in the past because we didn't have the information, right? Now today we have the internet. And it seems like it doesn't take long before we hear news of what's going on in our world. Uh, even stuff happened on the other side of the world when we're asleep. If we wake up in the middle of the night, we can look at the news and see, oh, what's going on on the other side of the world? We have quick access these days. Now, we have to be careful with our news sources because not all news sources are really good at giving all the information and giving the full truth. But we, today we see wars and even rumors of wars because of nations rising against nations. It also mentions here, though, earthquakes too, that there'll be an increase of, of earthquakes. I don't know if you've actually been studying earthquakes in the last while, but it's very interesting to see what's happening with earthquakes. Arnold Frutenbaum actually notes about um, earthquakes. And he writes this. The worldwide conflict that signaled the beginning of the last days has been coupled with famines and earthquakes. As far as famines are concerned, during the war years of 1918, in 1919, the pestilence killed 23 million people. In 1920, the Great Chinese Famine occurred, followed by the Great Russian Famine of 1921. The earthquake factor is even more interesting. According to the Encyclopedia America, between the years of 63 and 1896, 
There were only 26 recorded earthquakes. Pretty significant, isn't it? Almost 18, about 1,800 years, there was only 26 recorded earthquakes. Most of the world's earthquakes began to occur since 1900. In conjunction with World War I, there were several s- significant earthquakes. And I'm not going to read all of them here, but here's some significant ones. In 1905, India, an earthquake there, killed 19,000 people. In 1908, in Italy, an earthquake there killed between 70 and 100,000 people. In China, in 1920, there was an earthquake there that killed about 200,000 people. In 1923, Japan, the largest earthquake they had there too, was killed over 143 people, 143,000 people. The frequency of earthquakes has continued to increase too. I've, about 10 years ago, my wife and I started to research earthquakes a bit more because with homeschooling our kids, that's a topic that came up. And so we found a website from a university in the States that could show in real time where earthquakes were happening. And around that time, earthquakes were happening about once every week or two. Did you know nowadays you can download an app that shows you in real time earthquakes as they happen? And they're happening with greater and greater frequency. When I checked a couple of weeks ago, I'd found that in the last number of weeks and months that there have been earthquakes every single day to varying degrees of multitude, or of magnitude. So earthquakes have greatly increased. So much so that, remember the days when we used to hear of earthquakes that were about 6.0 or something like that, of earthquakes? When's the last time you heard about a 6.0 earthquake? Oh, this morning. Oh, okay. In Taiwan? Okay. I did, didn't check the news this morning, so. But it's not that often that we hear of these 6.0 earthquakes anymore because it's more the higher ones, like 7 or 8 or 9 point earthquakes, that we hear more about. What have we been hearing in the last 40 years, too? Along the Ring of Fire, along the western coast of the United States, there's always the, the talk now of the, the big one, right? There's concern that there's going to be a really big, massive earthquake along there. That's going to, that San Andreas Fault is going to be a big m- problem on the West Coast. I don't share these things to scare you, but these again are signs of the birth pains have started. That as these earthquakes increase, these famines increase, and wars and rumors of wars, these birth pains have begun. And again, these are signs that Jesus is coming soon. (coughs) Arnold Frutenbaum also says this about wars. The first time that such a worldwide conflict occurred was in the years 1914 to 1918 with World War I. Most historians agree that World War II was really a continuation of of World War I, which I mentioned that earlier. Both had a decisive impact on Jewish history. The events of World War I provided the impetus for the growth of the Zionist movement. While the Second World War set the stage for the establishment of the State of Israel. So we see these birth bang- pangs have begun. What's the point of action for us in this? What's up on the screen here too? Do not fear wars and rumors of wars, for these are signs of Jesus returning, that his returning are coming into fulfillment. We don't need to fear these things. I often hear from people who say that, oh, when they hear about, when they hear about um, the end times and tribulation and even these birth pangs, that they, it stirs up fear in them. But if we're a Christian, we don't need to fear these things. But to see these signs as a reminder, Jesus is coming soon. So that's the first birth pang. Nation against nation. Second birth pang is the reestablishment of Israel. Turn with me now back to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 to 38. And it's in this passage 
that we get these words that tells us again that the nation of Israel will once again be reestablished. <coughs> Beginning at verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. Now, God is saying to the nation of Israel here in this passage, there's going to come a day again where I'm going to be your king again. No more earthly king, but God will be king. Verse 34, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. Frunbaum believes that this is fulfilled in the reestablishment of the nation of Israel after World War II. And I believe and I agree with him on that. And since then, too, even though the nation of Israel has been reestablished, there's reports of Jewish people around the world who are continuing to come back to Israel. Now, there's actually two gatherings of Israel that we'll talk about in the future, too, but just to give you a little bit of a heads up. One is because of the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, all Jewish people at some point will be gathered again to the nation of Israel. And the second gathering of Israel is the nation of Israel getting right with God and repenting and returning whole as the nation back to the Lord. But in this reestablishment of Israel, that is the beginning of the reestablishment of Israel, of God calling the nation of Israel back together again. And God was going to bring all these people out of these nations. And God, as it says here, is going to do with his outstretched arm and with his wrath. Seems to fit World War II, doesn't it, in a way? Because what happened in World War II? Pretty significant event in World War II happened. And that was Hitler and the nation of Germany was trying to exterminate the nation of, of, of the Jews. To kill all the Jewish people. And this is significant then because after World War II, there's a cry out for the nation of Israel saying, hey, we need to give them a land again of their own so they have some protection again so that they would not be again, um, what's the term that we use? Not just extermination, but uh, um, genocide, yeah. Genocide of the nation of Israel. So that could not take place again. Well, we know that's going to try to be taking place in the future again because of prophecies about Israel still. Namely, Armageddon. But here we see again that God is reestablishing the nation of Israel. Verse 37, we also see this. I will make you pass under the rod and I'll bring you into the bond of the covenant. I'll purge out the rebels from among you and those who trans trans transgress against me. I'll bring them out of the land where they sojourn. But they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. This picture of coming under the rod is God saying to them, you know, this is a measuring rod, but it's also a calling of all the Jewish people back to be part of Israel again. To put them under his covenant with them again. We might talk about that, yes, the New Testament, we have a new covenant in Christ's blood, in his sacrifice on the cross. But as we see from the Old Testament, that God had a covenant with Israel that God said was going to be an everlasting covenant. And so there's going to be a day again that God's going to draw the nation of Israel back together and back together in him to fulfill that covenant again. And God is making, is beginning to have that happen again with Israel being reestablished and the nation of Israel coming together as one people again. Now we know that's going to take some time, isn't it? And we know there's several Jews who are not part of Israel still. I, I'd like to watch, listen to a, a gentleman named Ben Shapiro sometimes. And he's a Jewish, a practicing Jew, and also a nationality of, of Jewishness, too. And uh, so we know that there's a lot of Jews who are not back in the Holy Land yet. But God is starting to draw those people back to Israel. 
Turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 and 12. Here again is another prophecy that speaks to what we've just been saying already. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 and 12. In that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will rise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. This prophecy in Isaiah is saying again, God is going to gather all his people of Israel back together someday. And again, that began in 1948 when Israel was established again as a nation. That made it possible. And that is significant because, again, this is a sign that the time is near when Christ will return to take his church home to heaven. So what's the point for us in this? The point for us then again is to rejoice for signs of Jesus' return are coming into fulfillment. Here we have two birth pangs that are fulfilled already in preparation for Christ's return. The third birth pang now then is Jerusalem under Jewish control. Now there is no specific prophecy to talk about Israel, or Jerusalem being under Israel's full control, but we do know that when Israel was reestablished, that there's been war since then, part of Jerusalem was taken over by other nations at some point. Uh, namely, um, what's the country bordering Israel? I can't remember now. It's not Palestine. The, there's the Palestinians, but they're actually Lebanon, Syria, some of those nations in there, yeah. There was another country that was formed called the Palestinians, Palestine. But if you actually look at history, there was no such nation before the establishment of Israel. There are actually different nations that came together as a means to try to force Israel out of their homeland again. So if you study that, you can look online um, and look at some of the history of that. The Palestinians, you'll find that that's the case of Palestine. But part of Israel's history, as Israel's been reestablished, they owned part of Jerusalem because of conflict between the Jewish people and others. But today, Jerusalem is fully under Israel's control. And this too is another birth pain. Now again, there's no prophecy in God's Word that talks about Israel, uh, Israel getting the whole Jerusalem, but it's significant because of what's to take place either before the tribulation or during the tribulation. And there's some significant things that are going to happen in the tribulation that Israel had to have control of Jerusalem. Why? Because the end times temple has to be built. The third temple of Israel needs to be built. Again with this, there's no prophecy about when the temple will be built. Only that the temple is functioning during the tribulation because it talks about sacrifices that are going to be taking place. In Dan Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it talks about that there'll be an end of sacrifices for half a week. And that's because the temple had to be rebuilt. And this seems to happen again in the third temple, the tribulation temple. Then in Matthew 24, 15, it talks about the abomination of desolation, which takes place in the temple. And what that is, is the Antichrist setting up his own throne in the temple and saying that he is God. That Yahweh, the one true God, the God that we as Christians worship, doesn't exist, but that He, the Antichrist, is God. We see that also in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4, about the, the Antichrist establishing himself as God in the temple. Then also in Revelations 11, verse 1 and 2, it talks about the measuring of the temple during the tribulation period. So these are all passages that talk about the temple being established again and functioning and then taken over by the Antichrist. Again, there's nothing in God's Word telling us when this temple was built, 
only that it has to be functioning during the tribulation. So this temple might be rebuilt sometime even before the church is raptured. We don't, again, we don't know when, but that is, is functioning, though, during the tribulation. This is significant and took place, the possibility of it to happen, took place during what was called the Six-Day War. Do any of you remember the Six-Day War? I wasn't alive for it yet then, but uh, it happened a few years before I was born. I remember studying that, though, in history class when I was in grade school. And when I heard about this story, I was like, oh, man, that's, that's exciting. In fact, that's the, where the whole festival of Yom Kippur comes from, celebrating of the Six-Day War that Israel won. And it was, what it was was a few nations that decided to rise up against Israel, and Israel got wind of it and scrambled their fighters. And just with their Air Force alone, within six days, they defeated those three nations. And from that war, they took more ground back, which include the city, the whole city of Jerusalem. What we understand is the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock is today. Now, I'm not going to say much more about this part because you can listen to a past sermon I did on, on some of this about the reestablishment of the temple and where it will be built. We understand from God's word it's going to be built again on the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock is. <coughs> Again, we don't know when this will be built, but we know that the time for it is soon, too. Uh, in a past sermon I shared not long ago, too, about this very thing, that the nation of Israel is actually ready to build their temple. They have all the things that were part of the temple in the past, reforged and recrafted and remade. So all the, all the things they had part of the temple are ready to go. And they also started and have been training priests again to prepare for sacrifices when the temple is built. It's all ready to go. Even the Ark of the Covenant, they have in hand, and it's ready to go. All they need now is to build the temple. Again, we don't know when that will take place. It may not happen until even just before, the, just before uh, the tribulation. But we know that this is one of the birth pangs too, because Jerusalem had to be under Jewish control to build the temple. Then for us, what is the point of action for us yet again is to rejoice for the signs of Jesus' return are coming into fulfillment. Brothers and sisters, we don't need to be afraid of these three things. They're the signs that Jesus is coming soon. So these first three birth pangs again are as that nation rises against nation and with that comes famine and we see the increase of earthquakes. The second birth pain being the establishment, reestablishment of Israel that we saw after World War II. And number three, Jerusalem under Jewish control. These three have taken place. So these again are signs and reminders that Jesus is coming soon. So again, here's our points of action this morning. Do not fear wars and rumors of war. For these are the signs that Jesus is returning and coming, that his return is coming to fulfillment. And B, rejoice for signs of Jesus' return are coming into fulfillment. I don't know about you, but as I am studying and seeing what's going on in our world, as I study in terms of theology more, I'm that much more excited about Christ's return. I remember when I was at camp one time, uh, actually it was Ross Haven Bible Camp when I was a little kid. Remember there, and one year there was a biker, Christian biker, who was speaking to the youth that week. And I remember him saying that, you know, see the signs of the times, and, you know, I think it's pretty close. I, I have a good chance of making the trip home to heaven before his passing. I've shared with you several times, too, that I remember saying as a kid, I don't know when Christ is going to return. I don't, know, don't even think it's going to be my lifetime. But now as I see what's going on more and more, Christ may return in my lifetime. Again, I'm not going to predict dates because that's not for me to do. God's Word is very clear on that. We're not to predict dates because no one knows the hour or the day when Christ will return. But just that it seems like we're very close to Christ's return to take us home to heaven. 
So may you, my brothers and sisters, be encouraged. Jesus is coming soon. Next week, we'll be looking at four more birth pangs. And, um, and most of them have not been fulfilled yet. There are signs yet of coming, of Jesus is coming soon. Signs for us to remember that Jesus is coming soon. Look for Jesus' is coming. And be excited for his return. But also, as a reminder to us, be busy about the work God has called us to do. We've taught this morning about the vision God has given us as a church. And that's part of what God has called us to do. So may we be busy about his work till Jesus comes. May we be busy about the work sharing the gospel with those who are lost. May we be about the, busy, uh, the business of God making disciples and encouraging each other in the faith and growing in faith together. The harvest is about to come. Are you ready? Our time here is on earth is short, too. So again, are you ready? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these birth pangs that remind us that our time here is short and that you're coming soon. Lord, we don't need to fear biblical prophecy of things that are to come yet still or prophecies that have been fulfilled. But we can look at them in excitement and say, Lord God, you are good. You are showing your signs that you're coming soon. <coughs> These things, again, are signs that, that you are a true God, that you do exist. Because who could make these things up? There's too many factors for anyone can to control. And yet these things are coming true today. So again, Lord God, it shows that you are alive and true. You are the one true God. And again, points us to you, Lord Jesus, of how much you love us dearly. To die on the cross for our sins. To call us into relationship with you. And to call us into your service. So Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've called us into relationship with you. Lord, we pray for those who are listening right now too who do not yet know you, Lord God. That they too will recognize your love for them. That you've died for their sin on the cross that you offer them your free gift. As I'm praying these words to you, if there's anyone who has not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ, I invite you after this morning's worship time to come, before, to, come to me so I can share the gospel with you. And if you are listening online, may you too contact me. For those who are online, my contact information is in the description down below. I invite you to contact me so I can share the gospel with you so you might receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great love. Thank you for your love that you've shown to us of showing these things that are to come and these things that you are fulfilling. God, again, you are a great God. So full of kindness and love for us. Lord, may we not take your love for granted and may we love you daily in each moment too. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.